I think we can all remember where we were when the first teaser trailer for Morbius dropped on January 13th, 2020. I was sitting on the floor of my bedroom using my 30 minutes of Nintendo Switch time granted to me by my wife's boyfriend, and I remember a faint clapping in the background as I won my first ever match of Splatoon 2. But on the nightstand, I heard a buzz go off on my phone and asked my wife's boyfriend if I could use my phone for just a little bit more time today. And there it was. In all its glory, Sony Entertainment just posted a teaser trailer for Morbius. It was a glorious creation, and certainly didn't precede any other major tragic event of 2020. And after the best 2 minutes and 42 seconds of my life, I found out that this movie would be coming out that very summer. So that was a f***ing lie. Yeah, so Morbius didn't actually come out in 2020 or even in 2021, for that matter. It got pushed back quite a few times. It never actually got an official release date for that summer of 2020. In fact, we'd have to wait till March 19th, 2021 to see Morbius. Most people understood this, obviously, because at the time, most theaters were closed anyway. But then in January 2021, it got pushed back to October 8th, 2021. Then it got pushed back all the way to January 21st, 2022. But that time, it wasn't even because of the pandemic. They just didn't want to compete with No Time to Die at the box office. The film got pushed back again, but this time they at least made use of that time by doing some reshoots in February 2022. But why well, the f*** are they doing reshoots for a movie well, they filmed three years ago? You're probably finding yourself asking that question. But trust me, we'll get to that later. But eventually, we did get a final, official release date. The movie was finally released on April 1st, 2022. And I can't be the only person who finds it funny that they pushed the movie back again on April Fool's Day at that. Like, I feel like that seems like some sort of sick corporate joke. Regardless, after a long wait and an honestly large amount of hype for this film, and no, I don't mean those Morbius sweep jokes that were on Twitter for like a year. I mean actual hype for this film. It may seem weird now, but people actually wanted this film to do good. I mean, if you even go back and look now, the initial teaser trailers for this movie still have genuinely good reception on them. And you can see people in the comments who are excited for the movie to come out. People were excited. This movie was in line to be a box office hit. Psych! <laughs> So, what happened? Why did this movie with millions of trailer views, which had loads of people who were waiting for two years for this film, do so poorly? Well, firstly, the question kind of answers itself. People were waiting for two years about a silly vampire played by Jared Leto. Oh yeah, and that's another reason. Jared Leto. You'd be surprised how few people want to see a movie with an actor who treats their co-workers terribly and sends them used condoms. And anal beads too. I don't think those ones were used, at least not at the time they were sent. Who knows what Will Smith did with those. He was insanely difficult to work with anytime he was on the set of Morbius. Apparently he would act handicapped anytime he would step on set, which basically just made the entire process of filmmaking take like three times longer than it had to. But the largest reason that this film performed so poorly is actually just because it wasn't received that well. Yeah, believe it or not, people aren't gonna go wanna see a movie that the majority of people agree is bad. Sure, the MCU has bad films as well, but that's because the MCU has spent years building a dedicated fan base of mindless content whores who will engage with anything that they release, regardless of whether or not that product is good or bad, i.e. me. The movie did make a good amount of money, Let's not be mistaken, it made $175 million at the box office. And that's counting its re-release that made a flaccid $280,000. But what's pretty shocking is that it only made $40 million at its opening weekend. This is just a really funny story of corporations not knowing people are laughing at them and not with them. After Morbius' release, it's Morbid Time, Morbius, or some variation of a Morbius joke, was trending on Twitter for 90 days. I believe hashtag Morbius Sweep had over a thousand tweets for three months straight. I cannot find an article documenting this, but I swear to God this happened. So basically my source is just trust me bro. This is all to say that when those sweet sweet Sony execs saw that Morbius was trending, they thought it was a good thing. They thought that the movie only made $175 million in its first release period is because people were being silly and they were just kidding and they would definitely watch it if they put it back in theaters. So that was a f***ing lie. After the movie's released, it was received pretty negatively. A 5.2 on IMDb and only 15% of Rotten Tomatoes critics called this movie fresh. But all this time has passed and I'm beginning to realize I have no clue what this movie is. 
And I'm thinking if you clicked on this video, you're probably in the same boat as me of not knowing what made this movie so bad, but just hearing people talk about it all the time. So I'm going to be your spirit guide to this wonderful Morbius adventure, and hopefully we'll come out the other end of Jared Leto just a little bit smarter. This movie starts in Costa Rica with Morbius going bat collecting, which I'm sure is his favorite pastime. The pilot says we shouldn't be here when it gets dark, but don't worry, this is the opening scene of the movie. We'll be out of here in about 2 minutes and 24 seconds. Morbius also says he doesn't need a doctor because he is a doctor. Genius writing. He also summons these bats out of this cave by using his own blood, putting all of these people's lives at risk. That certainly isn't very Hippocratic oath of him. These people are actively running for their lives, and Morbius is just as disassociated as your average r slash LSD user. The editing for this transition feels really cheap, but we're sent back in time to Greece, where we find a young Michael Morbius. We meet this little f His name is Lucian, but Morbius insists on calling him Milo. This is horrifying because the first kid who slept in that bed was named Milo, and he died and he decides to inflict trauma on other people by calling everyone else who sleeps in that bed the name of his dead best friend. What a sweet way to honor the dead. Michael then goes on to explain that the blood disorder that seemingly all or most of the children have at this facility requires them to have blood transfusions three times a day. But why is he explaining this to a kid that has the disease? It's not like the disease started as soon as he walked into the building, and if it did, I personally wouldn't have recommended walking into that building. He's also already been seen getting blood transfusions before he even gave this monologue. Imagine getting blood transfusions mansplained to you. Morbsplained. Milo clocks out for a bit, but after Morbius fixes this machine in less than 8 seconds with a ballpoint pen, we meet Dr. Emil Nicholas, who sends Morbius off to a school for gifted children, and no, it's not the one you're thinking of. Morbius leaves a note for Milo and calls Milo his best friend, but like, why? They knew each other for less than an hour, like, less than like 15 minutes. I get that he saved his life, but he clearly had no attachment to him, especially because he refused to call him by his own name. The note blows out the window and these jerk-offs find it, and I shit you not, these kids beat him up and bully him for purely being disabled. And after the doctor comes to his rescue, Milo beats the shit out of this kid. Good for you, Milo. Loki, if I were that doctor, I'd, I'd act like I didn't see a thing. We get another 25 year time skip, this time it's Ford, where we see Morbius receive a Nobel Prize for making artificial blood, which he for some reason rejects, because similar to people who actually like this movie, Morbius, and I quote, has issues. Michael is called away by Dr. Bancroft, who fills in both the ethnic diversity and a love interest roles in this movie, so that he can help her cut through all of this hot, steamy romantic tension in this scene. Oh, and he just keeps these bats in the hospital. How the f*** did he get that in there? We learn that he's been mixing bat DNA with human DNA to cure his blood disorder. But I think Morbius has a little bit of a silly moment here, and he accidentally puts the antidote in a mouse instead. No wonder it didn't work, you dummy. You designed it for humans. And he gets to have a Nobel Peace Prize? Him? We see that kid from earlier doing something, and they put her in a medically induced coma. Is... is that really that easy? Oh hey, looks like the Mickey lived. Turns out Milo's still alive and still being cared for by the same doctor, and also incredibly rich. He goes to talk to Milo, and honestly, I don't have any witty commentary for this scene. It's pretty well written. In this scene, however, why the hell does he tell Milo he's close to a cure that's expensive, illegal, and unethical in the middle of this park? First off, don't tell him. That doesn't sound like you're close at all. And secondly, why do it in the park? Why not just, I don't know, where you were? This next scene takes place an undisclosed amount of time after and literally doesn't tell us where. It just says international waters. Wow. It's funny to me that the scene says international waters specifically because in the last scene where he's talking to Milo, he does say specifically that the medication needs to be made on international waters to avoid legal problems. But international waters, like you can't be like the Atlantic Ocean, like off the coast of Bolivia or something. No, just international waters. That's all you got. After a single test runs as a success, he figures, yeah, I'll inject this into my spine with a five foot precision needle. But don't worry, he makes sure to flirt with his friend before he makes her do the procedure herself. After being prepped for BDSM, he shakes a bit, then takes a nice short nap. 
This jack-off, we'll call him Andy, decides to be a general nuisance to Dr. Bancroft. This movie does what most movies do when you're bad at writing antagonists, and just makes him a sexist. He refuses to leave Dr. Bancroft alone after she asks oh so politely for him to leave the room, but they notice Mobius is gone and HOLY HOLY f HE'S ON THE ROOF OH GOD! He morbs the absolute f*** out of Andy. Dr. Bancroft gets fucking wrecked, but these guys are put down a little less gently and a little more permanently. I find the action in this movie to actually be pretty interesting, but unfortunately it doesn't last very long. This scene is more of a horror suspense theme, and it's interesting because I kinda just wanna watch him kill people, but it's not as engaging to watch because we have to remember this is our protagonist. Watching him systematically murk these guys is kinda just like a what the fuck moment right now. But to be fair, the scene is creative and my idea isn't that much better. Oh my god, he's hot. He goes to find the carnage that he left behind, but don't worry, it's okay, his hot doctor wife is still alive. He watches surveillance footage and realizes that maybe he's the problem. He calls for help and takes the cure with him with the, hmm, this might come in handy, look on his face, which is funny to me. He just threw up over the fact that he killed these people, but he's like, mm, oh well, you never know. Police come to investigate and they actually pretty quickly figure out it was Morbius. And also, they immediately port toward vampires because all the bodies are drained of their blood. That was a really weird first thought. I mean, you're not wrong, but like, it's it's really weird that it ends up being right, it, right? Morbius goes to check out his girlfriend, cute, I guess. Morbius walks into his office and spontaneously loses his ability to walk, much like Drake after a 21 Savage feature. He begins to test his newfound abilities, and to be honest, I'm kind of a fan of this scene, which actually makes me the world's first Morbius enjoyer. He then goes into the fucking bat tank because he just feels like they're cool now. More besties, if you will. He's also now got echolocation in these really hot ear folds. He learns how to use it pretty quickly, but personally, I'm not a fan of every single one of his abilities having these weird lines, like this weird effect that every time he uses something just goes off. He then realizes that artificial blood won't last for him forever, which becomes a central theme and struggle of this film. Does he want to drink the human blood, which he did already by the way, or does he want to die? To test his theory, however, he locks himself in a fucking box and throws away the key. And the only reason he is saved is because Milo just happens to show up. Like seriously, he did not have an exit plan or strategy for this. Milo learns that Michael has now cured rare blood disorder number 72 and wants to take the cure immediately. But Morbius refuses to give it to him because he'll also become a sick ass vampire and he just wants to keep that sick ass vampire swag to himself. But even after explaining that he just killed people, Milo just thinks that Morbius is being a silly little selfish guy, and Morbius has to force him out of the door. The detectives come to visit Dr. Bancroft for information, but it doesn't matter anyway because she claims to not remember anything, even though they still know it was Morbius. They should have just started there. So that scene was pretty pointless. They, they could have just done that scene on, on the boat. It's not like we didn't know she was in the hospital, like we already saw Morbius go see her. This nurse gets f***ing murked, but why the f*** is this hospital lit so poorly? It's a hospital, they're open 24-7, and this hallway is like entirely too long, to like an unrealistic extent. After all the huffle and kerfuffle, Morbius assumed that he morbed this person in their sleep and decides to do like my father in 2007 and dip out. But the ops show up and pretty quickly figure out that Morbius is the bad guy, so Morbius does like my mom in 2009 and dips out. He makes it to the top of this building and this happens, I, I genuinely I don't have any clue what this is. He gets detained, but personally, I'm a little distracted by how good Jared Leto looks in Prison Orange. Maybe we should just keep him there. Permanently. The detectives ask him why he killed the nurse, but he says he can't answer that. He begins to wig the f out and say he needs artificial blood, and I'm not making this shit up, but he says, I'm starting to get hungry, and you wouldn't like me when I'm hungry, making him the first person to be a derivative of the Hulk in 2022. Beat you to it, Jen Walters. Milo says that he's not capable of killing that woman and leaves behind a yummy bag of margarita. How thoughtful. Oh, but what's this? Milo left his cane. Silly Milo. It's a shame he can't walk with- Oh my god, he can walk! Morbius takes the blood to escape and track him down, but like... Why? Like, like, to do what? I know Milo has killed people, but legitimately, what does tracking him down do? He can't cure him, he also can't beat him because he's hopped up on yummy human blood. He literally talks to him, 
tells him to stop. They fight in the subway. Morbius has to retreat, but not before Milo kills a good amount of cops that would make a GTA protagonist cream their jorts. Oh, and he does this silly little dance. And, and Morbius escapes by flying. Yeah, that's I didn't mention that before, but that's that happens. He escapes because he learns how to fly. I, I don't really know what's happening here. The cops go looking for Bancroft, but she's able to narrowly escape and takes this random bus that she has no idea that she'd be on. Oh, and Morbius is here. He tells her that he needs to stop Milo and he needs her help to do it. This next scene is absolutely ridiculous, which I know sounds crazy to say, but trust me, this one makes probably the least sense. They go to this cafe, talk, catch up, figure out how to kill Milo, but Morbius overhears these random guys in the coffee shop who also happen to have access to a super lab. Those bad guys also bribe this waitress with fake money, but that literally goes nowhere. Like, it, they don't bring it up again. I don't know why they did that, but... Whatever, I guess. Morbius follows the bad guys to their lab using his echolocation, and goes against the Hippocratic Oath once again when they decide not to immediately hand it over to them. Like, why did, why did he do this? Like, he broke every bone in this guy's hand, even after his friends had left. This is really against Michael's character. I don't get why he would intentionally break these people's bones. Intimidation, yeah, sure. Rough him up a bit. Yeah, I can believe that but intentionally break every bone in this guy's hand. He also says, I am Venom. So that's, no, actually it's not very funny, but it's cool that they put a reference in here. Morbius gets to work making a cure for Milo and Jesus Christ, this scene is funny, but it goes on for like a minute and it's so weird. And the music choice is genuinely absurd too. Milo goes to a bar and talks to this woman and he swears up and down that they've met before, but I don't, actually know if they have. I'm probably the only person in this movie to have seen Morbius more than once, and I don't remember her on any watch throughs. I guess Milo just wanted to riz her up, but this jackoff has other plans. Wait, 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 actually, I don't get it. This guy's supposed to be an asshole, but he's actually this woman's boyfriend? So what's the issue? All he says is she's spoken for, then Milo continues advancing on his girlfriend, and this guy's girlfriend laughs when Milo calls him an asshole? Even if she isn't this woman's boyfriend, the scene is just too confusing. What is what is their relationship if they're not dating, and if they're not dating, why is she not like actively defending his her born boyfriend? Like he's he's being a douche, but Milo's Milo's hitting on her, which is emotional cheating. I'm confused, and the I know you thing never actually comes back either. We we don't know this woman, but the scene starts with 30 seconds of him saying, we've met somewhere before. This scene's too confusing, but long story short, Milo kills this guy, but I don't really get why uh, this scene is useless. We already know Milo's evil. Milo comes for Bancroft and asks if she knows where Morbius is, but she does the same thing she does to every other person in this movie and denies the fact that she knows what's been going on the entire time. Literally, all this woman has done in this film is be born in 1993 and lie. Okay, holy shit, I actually decided to Google when this lady was born, and I cannot tell you how mad I am about the fact that she was born in 1992. Morbius and Dr. Bancroft go to the top of this building and they kiss. This is so weird. He literally only says, close your eyes, come closer, and then they kiss. Can't be that easy. It's that easy. And some fucking how, Milo sees this shit. Sin City was a mavia. The cops grab some CCTV footage of Morbius killing those guys at the bar, and then they realize there's maybe more than one Morbius on the loose. But both eyewitness accounts and CCTV from the subway should have been enough to give this information. So I still think that last scene with Milo is pretty useless. Dr. Nicholas learns that Milo morbed himself, and he's honestly so nice to Milo right now. He says he'll help Milo, but he just doesn't want him to kill anyone, which is like the bare minimum. But for some reason, Milo still Wolverines his ass because he thinks he pities him. Nigga, he's been your doctor for what, 25 years? Also, I didn't actually catch onto this on my first watch through, but Dr. Nicholas also refers to Lucian as Milo, and not Lucian. Why? The only person to call Lucian Milo was Morbius, and he did that for like a day and never once in the proximity of Dr. Nicholas. But actually, wait, he actually does call him Milo. In the very beginning of this film, he says, I'll look after Milo when he says Morbius off to Morb Camp. This makes no sense. Regardless, 
Morbius makes an antibody that will kill Milo and also has a second heaping helping just for himself because he knows that the only person that can kill Morbius is Morbius. He gets a call from Dr. Nicholas and makes his way over there, but it's too late by the time he gets there. I mean, miraculously, he's still alive. He just can't make it to a hospital. He's honestly just being a little dramatic and times his death to exactly seven seconds after Morbius walks in. This scene is also really weird and not in like the zany way that everything else in this movie has been. I mean, like uncomfortable to watch. Milo literally whispers into Dr. Bancroft's ear to call out for Morbius and it's so cringe inducing. And I think somewhere in here, he calls her a good girl as well. But the scene where he's traversing the entire city is pretty cool. The purple effect on the Morb trail is actually pretty sick, to be honest with you. But it seems Morbius is late and is forced to take Milo's sloppy seconds as he's already eaten her out. Yes, I did force that joke. They kiss one last time and she bites his lip, which will definitely have ramifications that we'll see more than 36 seconds before the film is over. And he chows down on some ethnically ambiguous girlfriend and gets to work. There are some cool shots in this scene, but Morbius really just gets beat up for all of it. I, I don't really know what funny things I can say here. Like, nothing really happens. After about two minutes of subpar action and a subpar monologue from Milo, Morbius summons a fuck ton of subpar CGI bats. <laughs> and uses them to his advantage to inject Milo with the antibodies. If you guessed that the emotional climax of this movie would be Morbius calling Milo Lucian, his actual real f name, for the first time at the end of this movie when he kills him, congratulations, you now realize how predictable this film is. But honestly, this ending is perfect. Morbius comes out of the cave with approximately 10,000 bats. His GF wakes up and it reminds me of that scene from Blade 3 where they had to put CG on Wesley Snipes' eyes because he refused to open them. And Morbius rides off into literally fucking nowhere into the night. And the movie ends. I lied actually, the movie would have ended here if the pandemic never happened. This movie decides to connect itself to Spider-Man No Way Home with an end credit scene. I can't play the full scene here for obvious copyright reasons, but I'll leave you with a link in the description to it because believe me, it is the worst writing you will ever hear in your life. I could not make this shit up if I tried. Adrian Toomes from the MCU appears in a facility, which firstly makes no sense if you've seen No Way Home, that's not how the spell worked. And the only thing he says is, I hope the food's better in this joint. They let him go immediately because obviously they have no f***ing clue what's going on. This scene was obviously what was filmed during the reshoots, which is evident by its lower production quality and the fact that the dialogue isn't actually very coherent. Jared and Michael were clearly never in the same room together, but they meet up at the end. Vulture says that his being here has to do with Spider-Man, I think, and says a bunch of guys like us, and if you're keeping track at home, there's only two of them there, should team up and do some good to which Morbius replies, intriguing, and the movie ends. So what'd you think? So that movie was a lot. It was pretty incoherent and inconsistent, but I did find myself enjoying it at times. But let's start with what this movie did right. For starters, I think the acting was actually pretty good from everyone. I think the scripts could have been better for everyone as well, but I think everyone did the best with what they were given. This isn't to say that Jared Leto's method of acting is effective and should be encouraged. F that guy. But I will give credit where credit is due and say he did a pretty solid job. I also think that Morbius himself is pretty well written, but everyone else is kind of a cardboard cutout. I mean, you have female doctor and best friend with an accent. Oh, and father figure who definitely won't die by the time this film is over. No one really gets that much depth outside of Morbius. There isn't a lot of action, but most of what's there is pretty entertaining. I specifically like the first two fights with Milo and Morbius. It was a lot of fun to watch. Okay guys, I'm not gonna lie to you, I went to Google to look up things to like about this movie, like maybe I just forgot something, even though I've seen this movie twice. I even typed in Reddit after the search to make sure I would 100% get the most real answers that could possibly be out there for me, but I got nothing. So let's talk about all the things that made this movie suck now. Firstly, the movie is pretty much entirely pointless. Morbius as a character does not evolve or develop throughout the film. The large thing of this movie is that Morbius cannot drink human blood, and although he does take a sip from his friendly female fountain, hold on, I need to Google that real quick. Yep, 
yeah, it's porn. As I was saying, although he does drink his friend's blood, it hardly matters because he did it after she seemingly died. Like literally seven minutes after he drinks the blood, the movie is over, so why does it matter? Is he gonna drink blood now? Does he still even need blood? Are we getting a Morbius 2? All questions that we do not have an answer to. Literally one scene before this, he said artificial blood would not do it for him anymore, but it doesn't matter because the conflict is never resolved. Oh, and also the plot point about one, curing the blood disorder, and two, curing his morbidness never actually gets solved, so that's fantastic. After that, he needs to find a way to live without artificial blood, but that doesn't get solved either. Dr. Dad dying doesn't really have any effect on us in the movie because he's only there for like two scenes and those last like six minutes total. They're honestly not that great as characterizing him. Honestly, I could just only remember Sherlock Game of Shadows when I saw this guy. Like, yeah, sure, he cares about this kids, but why do I care about him? Like I said earlier, I like the action, but unfortunately, I think it does have more negatives than it does positives. For instance, most of it's not that clear, largely because a lot of this movie either one, happens at night, or is two, filtered to all hell and it doesn't help that they have this weird smoke lines effect on every single motion these guys do. I know I praised it earlier, but that's because it looks good when there's only one of them on screen. If there's two of them, it gets a little choppy to watch. The post credit scene is a mess of its own. If you remember, this movie was supposed to come out before No Way Home, not after. Meaning that this scene was shot, edited, and added to this film's run sometime between the time that No Way Home released in December of 2021 and this film's release in April 1st of 2022. It also doesn't really make sense that these two would team up. Contrary to comic Morbius, this Morbius isn't actually really a villain, at least not in this movie. And Adrian Toomes also isn't a hero, which I'm only mentioning because he says we'll do some good. I know he's not actually going to, but what's he getting at here? Also, how did he build an identical wingsuit within seemingly days of release from prison? He literally couldn't have. It requires Chitauri parts to make anyway, something that only exists in the MCU's universe. So that's even more unanswered questions. This scene was clearly Jared Leto and Michael Keaton in two different rooms after recording different bits of audio that were probably spliced together last minute. So let's plug this all into the Morb calculator, patent pending, and see what we get. So this movie was pushed back by over 20 months. The movie itself was poorly shot, directed, and written. It's not funny, it's not really that interesting, it's hardly entertaining, and they plugged in an end credit scene that's not supposed to be there two years after the film was made. This is probably the easiest 4 out of 10 I have given anything in my life. To be honest, I thought this movie was going to be pretty good. I didn't think it was going to be winning any Oscars, but I thought it would be at least be fun. And people were just shitting on it because people suck sometimes. But nope, it was actually just a bad film. Which is unfortunate because I don't think that this film is actually beyond saving. Honestly, rewriting bits of this film would save a lot of it. The whole thing with Morbius calling Lucian Milo is just really dumb, and it's supposed to be a he cared the whole time moment at the end. Yeah, nigga, we know he cared. He was trying to cure his freaking blood disorder. He broke the law and the Hippocratic Oath multiple times to do it. This was just Morbius being an asshole. That all being said, the movie's still fun. I would give it between a 6 or a 7, let's say a 7 on the fun scale. It's just a little boring and slow, but still a somewhat good popcorn film. It's more fun if you're just looking for something to poke holes in for 2 hours. Well Milo, that was the worst 2 hours of my life, and I watched the Emoji Movie last week. Wait, I thought, I thought you liked making these videos with me. What the fuck?